Welcome to this talk. I am Shandeep Shah and I am going to present our work called Fault Template Attacks on Blob Ciphers Exploiting Fault Propagation. This is a joint work with Ornob Bag, Devokyo Basurai, Shikhar Patronobi, and Professor Devdi Pupabadhai. All of us are from Secure Embedded Architecture Laboratory, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. Security is paramount in modern days. And to enable secure communication, we need cryptographic primitives such as block ciphers, hash functions, public key primitives like RSA, ACC, post quantum systems, etc. While most of the systems or cryptographic primitives are mathematically secure or widely believed to be secure, it is not in the case of implementation. In fact, mathematically robust crypto primitive is just the beginning of an end-to-end -end secure communication. In practice, implementations may leak secret information which can enable an adversary to perform several class of attacks. Among these implementation based attack classes, the most prominent ones are side channel analysis. Side channel analysis exploit the fact that the power consumption or electromagnetic radiation or acoustic signals coming out from a chip is correlated with the computation going inside and using this fact a passive adversary who is just observing these power signals or EM signals can extract the secret within minutes. In a very similar manner an adversary can deliberately inject a fault in the computation and exploit the faulty responses to extract the secret. In this talk, we will be mostly talking about fault attacks. And most of these attacks, like fault attacks or side channel attacks, are so powerful that minor counter modifications in the implementations cannot actually prevent these attacks. So, one need to dedicate separate countermeasure. And over the years, people have developed several countermeasures, both for fault attacks and side channel analysis. In this work, Reevaluate whether all these countermeasures work again fault at all classes of fault attacks or not. So as I mentioned in the previous slide that injecting fault in a device during encryption and decryption and analyzing the faulty response gives you the secret. Now there are several ways by which one can perform a fault analysis attack. The most popular one is called the differential fault attacks where the adversary can encrypt the same plain text twice once with fault once without a fault and then can analyze the differential between the correct ciphertext and the faulty ciphertext to extract the secret now interestingly in this class of fault attack uh, only a few ciphertexts are required faulty ciphertexts are required uh, in, the, in some cases the adversary can attack only with a single faulty ciphertext also the assumption over the fault fault is very minimal. For example, you just require a single byte fault, nibble fault, or maybe a multi-byte fault to extract the key even from ciphers like AES. However, in practice, we gain something more. In real devices, the faults are highly biased. By bias, I mean that over the entire possible fault space, only some of the faults occur again and again repeatedly and many of the faults never occur. Now, using the statistical bias in the distribution, an adversary can launch several other classes of attacks. For example, statistical fault analysis or statistical ineffective fault analysis, where the adversary is allowed to inject several faults on several different plain text and gather the faulty or correct ciphertext and analyze those ciphertexts to get the secret. There also exists another class of fault attacks where the adversary might not require to know the ciphertext. He just need to know whether the ciphertext is faulty or not. And exploiting that information as well, he can clearly extract the secret key. Some of the prominent members of this class are the safe error attacks, false sensitivity analysis, and blind fault attack. Now, when there exists attack, there also exists some countermeasures. Most of the fault attack countermeasures uses some form of redundancy in computation to detect fault. Redundancy can be two-way or n-way. 
and it can be applied at every round or end of the entire computation. One can also imp implement a redundancy temporally like for example, one can encrypt the same plain text twice and compare the results and then output it if both are matching or it can it can be implemented in space special domain like there will be two redundant branches computing parallelly. There can also be information redundancy like using error correcting or error detection code. If a fault is detected during the computation, no ciphertext is written or alternatively one can return a randomized version of the ciphertext or complete random string. But in general, most of the countermeasures existing follows this principle. Now, what kind of security guarantees does the redundancy provide? The answer is if you can inject a fault in one of one or two of the redundant branches, then somehow the fault will get detected and you will get a null. However, you can still attack in principle if you can inject fault, an equal valued fault to be precise, in all the redundant branches. However, if the degree of redundancy is fairly high, then the probability of injecting same valued fault in all of the redundant branches reduces. So it provides some sort of practical security if you assume the fault model to be like this. However, as we will show that this security is not sufficient. In this context, we present fault template attack. Unlike the previously proposed fault attacks, here we have an extra step that is the profiling technique. The idea is that the attacker may have complete access to a device which is very similar to the device he wants to target and he can extensively analyze this test device and construct and gather knowledge over that which is called as template. Now template building can be done in several ways for this specific paper we have utilized the fault propagation through digital circuits for constructing templates and use this template for successful pre recovery. Our attack does not require any ciphertext access, not even a direct access to the plain text, but in some cases we need to keep the plain text fixed. We can target middle rounds of block ciphers. The attack also works in the presence of both SCA and FA countermeasures. Note that previous attacks which does not require ciphertext access or can target middle round where safe error attack, false sensitivity analysis or blind fault attack. However, the popular side channel countermeasure masking is a countermeasure for these attacks as well. However, our attack works in the presence of both fault attack countermeasure and masking. The other attacks which works in the presence of both of these are CIFA and SFA. However, both of them require fault access to the ciphertext, which we do not require. Fault template attacks have two phases. In the first phase, the adversary is assumed to have a device in which he can set the key, he can also have the knowledge of the randomness that is being used inside. And using this device, he can inject faults in several locations and construct a template. Now, what is a template? Template can be described as a mapping where the domain set of the mapping consists of a function over fault locations as well as the observable that the attacker is observing. The observable can be many things, the side channel signatures maybe. In our case, we'll be using the fact that whether the outcome is faulty or not and it can extend to other things as well. The X part that is the range set of this template is some part of the secret. It might be a nibble of the secret key or a nibble of the intermediate state, whatever it wants. Now, once the adversary has this template and if he gets a device of similar kind, he can simply inject faults at some pre specified locations in this new device for which he doesn't know anything. And by referring to the template, you can extract the secret key. Now, as I mentioned, in this specific attack, we have constructed template using a property called fault propagation. 
Fault propagation and fault activation are fundamental properties of digital circuits. So, to be precise, when you see a fault in the outcome of a digital circuit, that is driven by two consecutive events. The first one is fault activation, that is the generation of the faulty computation at the fault injection point. And second one is the fault propagation, that is the how the fault reaches to the output of the circuit. Let us explain this by means of this SOR gate. So, if we inject a stuck at 0 fault at location A or wire A, if the value in the wire A is 0, then the fault has no impact, it does not change the output. However, if A is 1, then the fault gets activated, that is the value of A will be altered and one can see the fault impact in the output of the SOR gate. Note that in this case, the output corruptibility does not depend on the other input of the SOR gate. So, whatever value this other input carries, the output will always be corrupted. This is not the case in the case of AND gate. Here, even if the fault is activated, it might not propagate to the AND gate output because in this case, it depends on the other input value also. So, if the input is 1, the fault will propagate, otherwise it will not. Now, fault propagation and activation is data dependent. How? You can see that in the case of ZOR gate, if somebody is injecting a fault at some point, the data dependent activation of the fault will only lead to a faulty outcome. So, by seeing whether the outcome is faulty or not, the adversary can understand that the point where he has attacked, what is the value at that point. In contrast in the AND gate, if you see this example, the fault propagation in the output necessarily means that this input has value 1, also this input has value 1. So, basically the fault propagation of the outcome results in the leakage of two values A and B. Now, one can easily extend this fact, extend this fact for any combinatorial circuit and as, as, as an example, I can show that if one observes a faulty outcome here and the faulty injection location is this point, then he readily knows that B equals to 1. In contrary, if some faulty injection location is set here and the adversary can observe a faulty output here, he readily knows that A equals to 1 and C equals to 1 but he has no idea about the value of B. Now, let us see how can we exploit these facts to attack a real implementation. In this case, we considered a block cipher present with fault at a countermeasure and no masking. We also assume no cipher text access and the thing that only attacker knows whether the output is faulty or not. So, also allow to inject the attacker only one fault per encryption and we also ask him to keep the plain text fix. Now, if the attacker targets the S box, more precisely one polynomial of one output of the S box and injects a fault at this SOR computation in a stuckert manner, he can only observe a faulty outcome at this point or globally at the output of the cipher text if x1 equals to 1, uh, sorry x1 equals to 0 and he will not see any faulty outcome if x1 equals to 1. Note that the fault activation is playing the role here because in ZOR gate the fault propagation does not depend on anything else. In a similar manner, he can activate other faults in other locations and eventually can extract all x1, x2, x3, x4. Now, he can compile the knowledge of the outcomes of this uh, faulty outcomes, whether it is faulty or not and can extract the nibble of the key that is x1, x2, x3. Now, this entire knowledge can be compiled in the form of a table that is a template for this four fault location as it is shown here. And each of the entries in the template actually leads you to one of the key, key nibbles. Using these templates equally, one can extract an entire intermediate state and extraction of two inter, inter, intermediate states results in the recovery of the secret key. 
to a middle round attack. Now, these templates can also be used for performing an end round attack, like if you have the plain text access or if you have the cipher text access. The attack might be a little bit easier in the sense that you require lesser number of faults and lesser number of um, executions, but the attack principles will almost remain the same. Now, the question is whether this simple attack still works on masking. As I already mentioned, masking is a SCA countermeasure, but it still works for certain fault attacks like BFA or safe error attacks. The main idea of masking is to randomize the power consumption and thereby throttling the attacker from doing a attack. So, masking requires phrase randomness at every execution. The idea is to split one single value into multiple shares such that the sort of all the shares lead you to the actual value. The functions that are going to be operating on those values are also shared in component function and each of this component function can work on those shares separately and the outcomes of all those component functions if sort will return you the actual output. The effect. Now, this function splitting is quite trivial in the case of nonlinear function, uh, sorry, linear functions because in those case, um, each, each of the sh uh, component function will operate on only one single share and can give you the output quite clearly. But in the case of nonlinear function, each of the component function should work on multiple shares and the designer must be careful in this scenario because the combination of multiple shares may lead to potential leakage. So, this leakage has to be carefully handled and in practice there exist several successful methods which can perform optimal sharing for nonlinear functions. Now let us see how FTA works on masking scheme. One thing is quite clear that faulting linear terms in the logic does not work in this context. Why? Because effectively if you are faulting a Zorgate input, you are only gaining the information about that specific where. However, in masking, the information about one actual bit is shared among different shares that is different wares. So, just by uh, injecting fault at one single wire, you may not get information about all the wares and that will lead to a failure of this attack. But we will show here how to work in this context. Let us consider the simplest example a mask and get where x is shared into x0 and x1 and y is shared into y0 and y1. Now, here we exploit the fault propagation feature of AND gate. How? Let us assume that we inject a stack at 0 or even a bit flip fault at x0 and let the fault propagate through the both of these polynomials. Now, if the fault comes at the output of q0, then that means y0 is 1. Also, if the fault reaches the output of q1, then y1 is 1. Now, the actual output which is the sort of q0 and q1 is only faulted if y0 or y1 equals to 1 and it is correct if y equals to c. So, effectively by observing the actual outcome, unmasked outcome, you can readily understand whether the uh, uh, unmasked input is 0 or 1. Now, you are not observing this unmasked outcome. Uh, at the end of the AND gate because AND gate might be a part of a larger circuit, but due to the correctness property, even at the end of the encryption, if you observe a fault and no fault occur in any other places, then you can readily understand that this fault corresponds to the fault you have made in the input of the AND gate and that will readily give you the output, the unmasked out, uh, bit of the input bit of the AND gate. Now, let us see how can now we extend this idea for attacking actual implementations. In this context, we consider a faster TI implementation of present with three shares. The S box is divided into two sub functions F and G and in this attack, we specifically target different fault locations in the sub function F. Now, the sub function F is already shared and here I have shown the shares correspond to a specific output bit of F0. So, f0 equals to f10, f20, f30. Now, if I inject a fault at x20 using the similar principle described in the previous slide, 
the fault will only be propagated to the output if the sort of this tree that is equals to x to equals to 1 and otherwise the fault will never propagate to the output. Now using this fault location along with three other fault location we can actually extract the input of the S box and that leads to a template with 16 possible values and using this template we can perform a middle round attack on a must implementation of present with fault countermeasures. Note that in practice we may not get all the injection correctly and there will be noise in injection however we have seen that this noise noise can be circumvented by just increasing the number of observations that is the number of injections and number of execution and you can still do that as a practical experiment we constructed a faster ti implementation of present in hardware one configuration of it results in a faster secure side channel secure implementation and we target that implementation our target platform was sakura g2 and we have two boards of same family we inject em faults in this context which are non invasive that is no depackaging is required it's a bit level and it's quite highly repeatable that is same fault can be repeated with high probability and most interestingly reproducible that is the same parameters which we use for injecting faults in one device results in a very similar fault injection in the other device as well for example consider this table for one fault in, uh, for one nibble fault injection here if we just repeat these parameters for another sakuraji board with the same bit file embedded inside it it results in very similar faults and this really helps us to construct the template based attack. We construct the template on one device and paste the template, I mean do the thing, actual attack on another Sakuraji board and we are successfully recovering the keys in around 3000 to 4000 fault injection in total. We also tested uh, open source software implementation of AES with fast order masking where the AND gates were implemented in ISW manner. We simulated bit flip and stuck at faults and in this case our target was an AES implementation. We found that for the S box we required 16 different fault locations for constructing the templates and some of the entries of the templates might result in multiple uh, in, um, I mean suggest multiple values intermediate values but overall the attack complexity remains quite reasonable and you can recover the key within minutes. To conclude, template based fault attack is a powerful form of attack which can target combined countermeasures, middle and uh, double middle round attacks with no ciphertext access. And in this work, we have shown template building mainly with fault propagation. However, we would like to point out that template building can compile information from several other sources such as different or several different fault locations at different clock cycles and in this context as a potential future work we would like to analyze CIFA countermeasures which has been recently proposed it will be really interesting to see if CIFA countermeasure also works for template attacks however we would like to point out that template attacks are fundamentally different from CIFA in the sense that they do not need any ciphertext access and also template attacks can combine information from multiple executions of the cipher uh, of the cipher under the influence of fault so there is a hope that this attack might bypass some of the cipher countermeasures however it requires further experiment to comment on this fact uh, straightforward extension of this attack is also possible for hash functions or mac like or authenticated implementation authenticated encryptions we would also like to extend this attack in future for public implementation. So hereby I conclude our talk. If you have any question, you are encouraged to ask that during our live session. Thank you.